So JIT compilers are all the rage nowadays, with many popular programming languages adopting them, such as um, Julia, JavaScript with the V8 engine, and certain implementations of Python, like PyPy. In this video, I basically want to go over some of the intuitions and the implementations behind these JIT compilers and look at how they impact like, the performance of code. So one of the most significant advantages of using a JIT compiler is the performance impact. And I think we can go off all of the benchmarks on the internet, but I think it also might be really interesting to do our own profiling and our own experiments to really quantify how much JIT compiling can help you in your specific use case. So here, what I've done is I've uh, written the same program twice using uh, two different tools uh, in Python. So one of them is NumPy, it's a very standard scientific computing thing. And the second one is Numba, which is this kind of new sort of technology that uses JIT compilation to essentially compile certain functions and make it faster. So um, they can both act on NumPy arrays and that's just to reduce the memory latency because NumPy arrays are, they aren't stored as linked lists like normal lists in Python, they're actually just dist like distinct arrays on memory. So that should make that a bit quicker so we can actually focus on just the computation aspect. So for this really simple function, right, which is s squaring an array, shucks, you can see the uh, implementation of it up here, right? As you can see, the speeds are kind of comparable. Uh, in fact, um, I think this number square thing will be a bit slower the first time we run it just because it has to compile the function. But as you can see, when, when I run it again, it's 6.3 milliseconds versus nine. Uh, uh, sorry, 6.3 nanoseconds versus nine, 9.9. .9. So fairly comparable. However, um, the, the part where JIT compilation really shines, and this is something interpreted languages generally struggle with, is dealing with less like linear sort of data because uh, NumPy is able to, to do that computation so quickly because it essentially calls down to some C code, right? Um, which is why you need to create NumPy arrays. And that's why NumPy arrays are so much faster than performing the same operations with like a list or something. However, for much more like I guess dynamic sort of calculations. For example, this is the this is my implementation of the Colatz conjecture. For those of you who don't know what the Colatz conjecture is, it's basically just this math thing that says uh, if you perform this operation to any integer, it'll get to one, right? And this is just a function to check how many iterations it takes. And the reason why this is kind of a more dynamic sort of uh, problem is because there's so much branching in there. Unlike with a square function where you just need to do the same thing, there's a lot more branching. And the results really show. So I'm running this number version on uh, up here. And as you can see, we're getting about 6.4 milliseconds um, to run the Collatz conjecture for all the numbers from one to a thousand. And then here, uh, the NumPy version is a hundred milliseconds. So that's actually a huge improvement. Sorry. That's actually a huge improvement, about a 15x increase in speed, right? Now, obviously this example is very contrived and I picked an example specifically to highlight the power of JIT compilation. But I think that's kind of where the elegance of it comes in because if you can design good algorithms to detect where these sorts of like, where a function is called repeatedly and it's eating into a lot of your performance, JIT compiling just that one function can totally reduce the bottlenecks for your program and give you a lot more speed in the long run. So now that um, kind of you guys know why why should, why we should care about this sort of technology, uh, I'm going to go and uh, show you the implementation of it. Before we can start compiling programs on the fly, we need to figure out how to run pre-compiled bytecode from inside a run already running program. So here's an example program I wrote that literally just returns the integer five. And this is me compiling that program using um, NASM and then displaying the resultant bytecode using obj dump. 
we can now directly take that bytecode that we compiled our assembly to and put it in an array and cast it into a C function pointer with this function pointer syntax below. And then we can just call it like a regular function and print out the result. And other than the slightly confusing function pointer syntax, I think this is a really simple and effective way of performing this task, except for the fact that it doesn't work and we get a seg fault. To be honest, we are pretty close to the actual solution, but the reason why our program seg faulted is to do with permissions. Just like how files in a Unix system have read, write, and execute access for different users, uh, allocated memory also has that. So this usually doesn't come up uh, because most stack allocated memory and most memory you get using malloc uh, automatically uh, has read and write privileges for the user. However, those segments of memory aren't executable by default. And that is kind of what we need to just tweak so that the operating system allows us to run like random pieces of memory as code. So this is the part in the video where I think everything gets a little bit platform specific. Uh, because honestly, I don't know how these functions are handled on a Windows computer or on a Linux machine. Um, but I'm assuming there will be similar kind of alternatives for both those operating systems that you can search up. Okay. On macOS, uh, there's a, fu um, a function called memprotect or mprotect, and it basically handles everything we needed to. So it lets us take a page of memory and change its um, access permissions. The only problem with using this function is that, as you can see, um, it needs the address to be page aligned because it changes the permissions for the whole page of memory, not just the se segment of memory that we've kind of chosen. So <clears throat> this is a little bit trickier um, for us to work around uh, because the normal malloc function doesn't automatically align the allocations. However, um, as is pretty convenient, there is a function called aligned alloc that does exactly that um, down here. Now, the only thing that's left is we need to figure out what is the page size of our system. So how do we know what alignment we should ask the operating system? And luckily, there's a simple command called page size that tells us it is exactly 496 bytes. And putting all of that stuff together, this is what we get. It's very similar to the previous program, except now we are um, allocating kind of a separate part of memory, not on the stack like before, but this time on the heap. And we're then changing the permissions of that uh, bit of memory. We're using memcopy to copy a program into it, and then we're casting it back to a function pointer and calling it just like before. And if we just compile the program and run it. So now we've done the compiling bit, we've done the running bit, the only thing that's left to do is bring them both together and do it just in time as we're running, as we're interpreting a program. So um, for this example, I didn't actually go out of my way and write like a full scale language to demo it because I don't have the time or the energy for that. Um, instead, uh, I'm just using this sort of toy example I wrote, which is a just in time compiled calculator. Essentially, it uses a JIT compilation to speed up, and I'm putting speed up in air quotes here, uh, the speed of the calculator. Now, of course, uh, I do wanna make it very clear that this is uh, so much slower than just a normal uh, calculator app. Uh, but I think a calculator is a, it's a really nice and simple sort of programming language, I guess. Um, so I can kind of demonstrate some of the functionality. Now, I just want to draw you guys' attention to a few things. First of all, uh, this bit over here, which should be familiar. It's the exact same thing that we had in the uh, in the previous example, except this time we're generating the bytecode uh, programmatically um, through parsing uh, this expression here. And secondly, um, this bit up here, which is our instructions to bytecode. So this is actually like the heart of the program. It takes the uh, abstract syntax tree that we've created, um, it turns into instructions and then it takes those instructions and 
translates them directly into bytecode. Now, um, if you do dig into this, you'll notice that I didn't actually use any register allocation algorithms. In fact, uh, all of the bytecode here doesn't even touch doesn't touch a single register um, in the CPU because that just adds in a whole lot of complexity into the program, which my you know, my brain wasn't able to handle. Uh, but what it, what it essentially does is it takes this array of constants here and s slowly adds and subtracts values to and from that array. Um, and then it just returns and we know that the final value is gonna be in this position, constants re result location. So I'm gonna stop beating around the bush and actually run the program. And you can see we get the value 14, right? Uh, which is exactly what we expect because that's two plus three times four. And do note, like you can change these values around and it works perfectly fine. Minus 10. Yeah. So I'll link this code down in the description below in case you guys wanna look at it. And um, I'll also link uh, the PyPy code base because I think that's a great example of seeing uh, JIT compilation in like an actual real life setting. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching and happy JITting.